the algorithm. Is my phone listening to me? Does Google know everything about me? Why do I get ads for things I talked about with my friends? We hear people referencing the algorithm all the time, especially on social media and in video content. But what actually is this mysterious force that seems to power so much of the internet? Let's start this discussion by looking at where the word algorithm even came from. To do this, we need to go back to the year about 780 or so. At that time, there was a mega mathematician and astronomer named Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi. He was the it guy for math at the time. He wrote a book, which in English translates to something like numbers and numerals and reckoning according to al-Khwarizmi. When this book was translated into Latin so that other people could check out the theories, the last name was also translated into Latin. The translation resulted in algorithmi, which you can probably see looks a lot like algorithm that we use today. Over the years, this algorithmi transformed into the algorithm we now know. Fun fact, this guy was also responsible for the word algebra in much the same way as algorithm came through, through translation. Algorithm today, in the broad definition provided by Merriam-Webster, refers to a step-by-step -step procedure for solving a problem or accomplishing some kind of goal. More specifically though, we use it a lot to talk about a kind of rules-based process for doing something. A super simple example of this is an if-then algorithm, which basically says if one thing is true or false, then something will or won't happen. In everyday life, we use this kind of system all the time for decision making, like when we're thinking about whether or not to eat something. If I'm hungry, I'll get a snack. If I'm not hungry, I won't get a snack. You check in with yourself to see whether your state as hungry is true or false and make your decision accordingly. Though yes, I guess there are some people who are going to go for the snack regardless of hunger. That's what's the point. <laughs> the point is, this is a very simple rule-based procedure for making a decision or solving a problem. So how does this relate to your experience on the internet? Well, you, as a consumer of content on the internet, need to access stuff to consume it. When you want to eat a snack, you need to be able to access the snack to put it in your face. When you want to learn something new online or watch something entertaining, you have to be able to access the content in order to put it in your brain. This is where internet algorithms come in. Let's start with search. When you go to a search engine website like Google or Yahoo or even Bing, you type in what you're looking for and hit enter to search, right? Then the search engine comes back to you with a big list of options that may or may not fit what you were looking for. The search engine has gone out and looked at a bunch of data and come back to you with those results in that specific order of relevance. So what's going on there? How is that list populated and how is the ranking determined? In big search engines like Google and Yahoo, factors like keyword density, the mobile friendliness of a page, related links connecting to the page, page loading speeds, page security, and website URL matter. In in recent years, Google has even started looking into the creators of content to determine how reputable they are and factoring that into their page rank results. All of this data, and other factors too, is used to determine when and where a page will appear in a Google search result, but the general public doesn't know the exact formula of the algorithm, so it's not as simple as checking off a list of tasks when you build your website. Also, even though search engines look at all kinds of information about websites to determine their search results, it doesn't mean that you trigger an epic search of the internet. With every single search you do online. Search engines have little robot scanners. Googles are sometimes called spiders that are constantly out crawling the internet inspecting websites. They examine links coming in and out of the page, the text on the page, how well the page works, etc. And then it passes this information on to Google and Google sorts the information accordingly. This is a process called indexing. Basically, the search engine adds the site to an index of content on the internet. The index refreshes as content is added, updated, or removed. And that means data and content is basically being updated and refreshed at all times. This is a constant ongoing process that aims to make sure that information available on search engines is as relevant and recently updated as possible. These crawler bots go out and find content, examine it, and pass the data to Google, which indexes the content and then serves it up to you when you put keywords relating to it in the search box. Straightforward. Search engines make money by selling advertising. If you've got something to sell, you can just buy a spot at the top of the search results for a specific keyword. This is an imperfect system, sure. People can try to game the system and trick crawlers by spamming keywords on a page or creating link farms. While these kinds of pages aren't usually dangerous, you generally just find low quality information on them. 
This current way of operating a search engine also makes it extremely difficult for niche or independent websites to get organic traction on Google because search results are dominated by big brands and well-known figures like celebrities and business leaders. But this is the system we have today. With this in mind, let's shift the focus of our discussion of algorithms because search engine algorithms and social media algorithms are different beasts. If you have a social media account that you use regularly in any capacity, whether to post, reply to people's posts, keep in touch with friends, lurk, or just save things of interest, you interact with social media algorithms. Similar to search engine algorithms, generally social media algorithms are ostensibly trying to show you things that you may be interested in, whether that's pictures of your friends and family, your favorite YouTube creators content, some travel spots you might find inspiring, or just a cat video. But social media algorithms work a bit differently from search engine algorithms. Algorithms. They rely much more heavily on individual user behavior to make content recommendations. With social algorithms, we sometimes make our own selections for content, but we sometimes get content that we haven't chosen for ourselves. Let's break down what's happening here. Obviously, the most basic thing you can do to get updates about a certain topic or from a certain creator is, of course, to follow that account. Please subscribe to this channel. Once you follow someone on Twitter, for example, you're supposed to be able to see all tweets from that person in your Twitter feed. If you subscribe to a channel on YouTube, you're supposed to get their latest videos in your subscriptions feed. You might notice I'm saying supposed to instead of you will see all their updates. This is because social media algorithms can get a little bit murky and they've been getting increasingly mysterious over the years. Depending on the platform, if you don't regularly interact with a creator or artist, you may see their updates less and less. Part of the reason for this is that social media algorithms use your behavior to help determine what you see. In theory, this sounds good, right? For example, if you follow a bunch of recipe accounts and like a bunch of vegetarian recipes, the algorithm learns, hey, this person is interested in vegetarian recipes. I'll show more of that. And at a very basic level, this is what social media algorithms aim to do. Identify the kinds of things you're interested in seeing and show you more of that. But if you stop interacting with that kind of content, you see it less and less. It seems pretty great and straightforward, right? But social media platforms are businesses. Businesses have to make money to continue operating. Fair enough. Lots of social media platforms use advertisements to make their money. You might even have seen an advertisement at the beginning of this video. It happens all the time. If you click on a business's ad to check out what they offer and maybe even buy something, the business is happy and continues to spend money advertising on that social media platform. You are also hopefully happy because you found something you were interested in and learned how you could get it. This is the part where things start to get extra tricky. Because so many of our accounts are linked online, our email addresses, social media accounts, search history, etc., data about the things we've searched for recently gets collected and used to target us with additional ads. This is why we'll often see an ad for a product on our Instagram feed after searching for it an hour earlier. The search engine algorithm knows we were recently looking for that product and may be in the mood to buy it. Our search history is, in many cases, connected to our social accounts through our devices and logins, so the social media platform notices a match between a recent search and one of their advertisers. Then it gives us an opportunity to buy the thing, which would make their advertiser happy. So if you're on the social media platform for more time, there's a greater chance of you seeing an advertisement for something you want. The platforms know this, so it's in the best interest of the platform to continue showing you lots of things you like and keep you hooked on the platform. If the platform can continue minute after minute to show you things that make you feel something, whether that's excitement or disgust, terror, hatred, happiness, whatever, chances are higher you're going to stick around. The infinite scroll capability was designed to make it so you never had to click away from a page and wait for more content to load. This has resulted in behaviors that are highly addicting. In reality, a lot of social media users don't follow people who post every single day or even every week. Some people don't post at all, but the platforms know that people want to open their feeds and see something of interest. This is where recommendations come in, and this is what has been inundating social media feeds with increasing frequency the last few years. Social media feeds serve recommendations based on your interests to keep people coming back, even if there's no content from the people they've actually chosen to follow. These recommendations are determined by algorithms that have been tracking the things you click on, the videos you watch, the searches you do, etc. And it provides you with those posts because based on what the data collected shows about you, it thinks you might like those things. YouTube, for example, takes into account how many people click on a video based just on the thumbnail and title. It also takes into account how long someone watches the video and at what point they drop off. 
These are factors we generally don't think very much about when we're browsing YouTube, but they're behavioral indicators of what we do and don't want to see. And the YouTube algorithm factors those things in when recommending new content to us. One topic that's gotten more and more coverage over the last few years is whether or not the microphones on our smartphones have become a part of this algorithm or not. Overwhelmingly, the answer is no, our phones are not listening to our conversations. But people will often respond, well, my phone showed me an advertisement for something my friend and I talked about at lunch yesterday, even though I'd never seen or heard of that before. This is real, but this kind of tracking doesn't utilize your smartphone microphone. There's something way more sophisticated happening here. Our smartphones, in addition to being tools we use for entertainment and communication, have GPS trackers in them. When we meet a friend for lunch, for example, the GPS trackers in our phones know that we met because the positions of our phones are physically close for an hour or so. They're our friend, so we're likely connected on a social media platform like Facebook or Instagram. Search algorithms and social media algorithms on your phone have been tracking you and your behavior. Same goes for your friend's phone and the algorithms can guess that two people meeting up for an hour are going to talk about some things they've read about, learned, or investigated recently. You might talk about a new TV show, a product you're thinking of buying, a new restaurant you made a reservation at, whatever. Your conversation will probably cover a lot of topics because we're human. After your meetup with your friend, your phone may show you content identical to the topics you discussed with your friend because your phone was close to your friend's phone and the algorithms may make a guess about what you want to see following that conversation. For example, if you talk about a popular new restaurant with your friend because your friend recently went after making a reservation and taking pictures there, you might be surprised to see an ad for that restaurant appear on your phone after you say goodbye to your friend. This is the algorithm and GPS tracking at work, not your microphone. Your phone will probably also show you a bunch of other things your friend recently searched for or interacted with online, but these won't stand out to you because you didn't talk about these topics. The one thing that does show up on your feed that you also happen to talk about is the thing you fixate on. The other advertisements don't even register because you're not aware they're relevant to your friend at all. It's pretty sophisticated. So you might be wondering, are algorithms good or bad? The answer is neither. Search and social media algorithms are tools that impact the lives of billions of people every single day. Something that started from a medieval mathematician has now grown into a tool that powers a huge part of the digital world. This video isn't about saying whether they're good or bad. It's about breaking down some key terminology that gets thrown around a lot. It's also about exploring how algorithms work and how we interact with them. Everyone can make their own choices about how to operate online, but it's good to know the forces at work behind the internet are there for more reasons than to serve you adorable puppy videos 24 seven. If you like this deep dive into the word algorithm and a bunch of other related topics, let me know. And of course, like and share this video because it helps me get a little more traction with the algorithm. If you enjoyed this video, here's another one you might like. Take care out there internet and see you next time.